performance on the field. So as I say that, I'd like to introduce former SID, Braden Snyder, who was here for 11 years from 2007 to 2018, and he's now the head director of athletic communications at Drew University. Braden, welcome back to the fold. It's awesome to see you. How's life at Drew? How is Misty? How is Clay? Hey, Corey. Hey, everybody. Hey, thanks. Thanks a lot for having me and uh, thinking uh, enough of me to, to welcome me back. Uh, it's uh, it's been good. Yeah, we're here in Madison, New Jersey, for uh, coming up on two years now. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, it's a it's a, a spring like uh, like no other. It's um, you know, of course, our, our hearts go out to the spring student athletes who had their seasons cut short. Um, and uh, but you know, just trying to stay busy from the, the home front here. Um, you know, I think the landmark conference and Drew um, called off their spring seasons around the same time as Gettysburg, and so uh, in the Centennial Conference. And so I think we're probably on a, on a similar timeline as as you all are there. Um, but um, yeah, no, things are good. We're yeah two-year-old here and another one on the way um, this summer. So we're excited about that for sure. But, uh, but no, thanks, for, thanks again for including me in on this. Uh, it was a lot of fun kind of going back uh, through memory lane and thinking back on some of the many great games um, that I was able to, fortunate enough to be able to witness. Yeah, I tried to do the fast math in my head to how many games we may have seen in our 11 years together. And uh, I think we're probably looking at probably 2,000, over 2,000 games that we covered, and then at least half of that that we saw in person. And of course, all those wonderful neutral site games from NCAAs and Centennial Conferences as well. Now, I also tried to do the math for Bob Kenworthy. Uh, that's impossible because he was here in Gettysburg as a teenager. He came to Gettysburg, to Adams County as a teenager in the 1940s, got real close with the Brain family, and actually came to many games football, baseball, you name it, basketball, uh, basketball games in Plank Gym, football games at Memorial Field. And the baseball field, I believe, was in the middle of campus at the time. And then he was SID from 1959 to 1999, 40 years when the growth of the program went from about 10 to 12 sports when he first got here to 23. I believe women's golf came in the year after he left. So he saw the transition from university division to division three. He saw multiple conference championships, multiple conferences. He really saw it all. And I loved looking at his list right now. I don't know if, if you had a chance to see it all and, and some of the games and some of the memories that pulled out. He, he and I have had the discussion on that Bucknell game multiple times, and we actually have video of it, which was incredible. Um, and just to watch the Bullets and Bison kind of battle on the front line in a completely different type of football is so awesome. And the way he tells the story, because he was an impressionable teenager, was is just wonderful. I, I've had the first person story, not just the written story. What kind of stood out to you about Bob Kenworthy? Kenworthy's recollections from fifty yeah, they were, some years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great and, and amazing. You know, to to be able to recall these events from from you know really a bygone era. It's uh, so interesting. You know, <laughs> um, you know, just picking up on all the nostalgia from that that time. You know the the floats and just the great, you know, event that homecoming was, and not that it isn't now, of course, but just such a different kind of event then. And you can see the, the massive crowd on the sideline in that, that video. It's just um, so, so interesting to look back on that. And, um, you know, and, and describing the basketball game where Wheaties Parker uh, had trouble reading the clock. <laughs> like, wait, what? Uh, you know, I guess they're the clock at hands, and you know, it's it's just um, amazing that um, you know I, I always enjoyed uh, thoroughly enjoyed talking to Bob during my time at Gettysburg. Just a wonderful person and uh, an absolute wealth of knowledge. Um, but it must have been it must have been outstanding to be able to witness some of some of the things he he witnessed um, in the university division era and, and being you know uh, around for. Um, just some, you know, covering some great athletes from Ron Warner to Wheaties Parker to um, some of the others that he mentioned here, Don Ardinger and track, you know, mm -hmm. these are definitely some, some of the all-time greats at Gettysburg. And, um, but um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, 
you know, and I'd like to see his B list. You know, I'm sure there were <laughs> so many, uh, so many games he could have, he could have talked about. Um, it's, uh, but uh, no, it was, it was, a, it was a pleasure reading that. Yeah. Talk about, he could have done a forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties list, maybe even two thousands. He's been around. He comes back to bring Jim uh, Shirk field on occasion too, to catch the bullets in action too. So there is probably not a soul alive that has seen more bullets in action than Bob Kenworthy. So thank him very much for contributing to this article earlier in the week. And of course, the man that followed Bob was Matt Daskovich, who I had the pleasure of connecting with a couple of weeks ago. The first time I've interacted with Matt, um, it was great. He, he works in Philadelphia. Um, obviously, you interacted with Matt when you were the SID at Lebanon Valley. He was the SID at Gettysburg. And you and I both commented on his writing style is just amazing. There were a couple words, like I consider myself a bit of a wordsmith. I had to look up a couple words that he used in his stories. So what do you think of, of Matt's list? And obviously he pulled back that on the 20th anniversary of the Women's Across Centennial Conference Championship uh, when they beat Haverford on the road. That was before the tournament was in play too. So the regular season champion was the conference champion at the time. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun to read read what Matt had to share. Uh, really, really colorful um, writing, for sure. Um, I agree with you on that. I uh, yeah, I work. I had a chance to work with Matt, like you said, when I was first starting out uh, in this business. And I, I believe Matt came up from Gettysburg when Gettysburg played Lebanon Valley and helped me uh, work my first football game. Um, so he was he was definitely a, a huge um, huge help for me. And I always, I always had a lot of great respect for Matt. And I think he did, he did a lot, a lot of great things during his time uh, in that position and following up Bob. But uh, yeah, some great games, of course, that he talks about here. Um, the, you mentioned the Women's Lacrosse uh, Centennial Conference Championship. Um, kind of helped get, uh, get it all started there in terms of um, their run in the Centennial Conference. Um, yeah, th some games here, I, I, I don't think I had ever heard of the, the men's lacrosse game where they beat Middlebury in the muck of the practice field. I don't, I don't know that I was, I think that was the first I ever had ever heard that, but that must've been, must've been a, a pretty big, a pretty big game um, going up against the team that uh, they had faced in the national championship game, the two previous years and, uh, and, and coming away with a, a win. And uh, yeah, and of course the Paul Smith game with the NCAA record for all purpose yards, <laughs> something of a, a you know, a legend at Gettysburg. Um, I don't know how many times we've talked about that game. Just to see someone pile up 390 rushing yards and 527 all-purpose yards. Like, I, I can't imagine. Uh, <laughs> absolutely. And um, I, I like what he described the men's basketball conference championship game that year, kind of comparing it to a game seven, going back to the previous six meetings between those two schools, between Gettysburg and, and F&M uh, men's basketball. And um, talking about how the, the bullets went in and, and uh, grabbed the title uh, in a very hard to, hard to play uh, gymnasium there uh, at the Mazer Center. So uh, yeah, I think Matt had, had some great perspective there with those games and and what was I'm sure a great time to be working at Gettysburg. A lot of successful teams across the board and um, kind of coming into their own in the Centennial Conference for sure. Yeah, Matt and I had a great back and forth for a little while. We talked about three or four basketball games because it was such a great series with them and F&M and also Dickinson. And he actually referenced one of the first games he talked about was a loss when F&M, Alex Kraft hit a half-court shot at the buzzer to beat the Bullets one year. And then a lot of the same guys were on that 2002 team, uh, Curtis McNeil, um, Terrence Callahan, a lot of those guys. And they ended up winning it too, of course, on F&M's home court. I can just imagine because Curtis was – Curtis McNeil was just inducted in the Hall of Honor. And I can just imagine him sitting at half court with his headphones on, just zoning out and getting ready for that game. Yeah. So the man that followed Matt, so props to, to Matt for contributing too. It was great touching base with him. Um, great getting to know him. We're friends on Facebook now. So, yay. Then we have Eric Lawrence, who was here for about 15 months. He followed Matt. He, pre he preceded us. And Eric had a really interesting year, too. A lot of success. I remember the first time I met Eric because there was a stack of paper sitting on his desk because they were transitioning from the college CMS, uh, content management system, to what we have now, GettysburgSports.com. And Eric played a huge role in transition to that. You and I have talked about this multiple times in yesteryear, like 13 years ago, about it. 
how awful it would have been to update stats, statistics, um, schedule, rosters, everything on the old CMS. And Eric played a huge hand in making sure that we were efficient and we could get our inf information out there as quickly as we could after games. I loved Eric's list too. Um, he, he commented that he hadn't seen soccer very much as a kid. And then his first, his number one pick was that game against Muhlenberg in 2006. So what do you think of Eric's list? Yeah, it was, uh, again, I think in his sh short time at Gettysburg, it looks as if he, um, he was able to witness a lot of good games. These are all really, almost all these games are barn burners, you know, in, in big games coming right down to the wire. Um, you know, get, you know, women's lacrosse versus F&M, two overtime game there, um, an overtime game against TCNJ later in the season. Um, men's lacrosse beating Haverford by a goal in the conference semifinals. Um, you know, just so many, so many really good games. And, and, and at a time baseball again, game. Yeah, 20 to 19 baseball game. Um, in nine innings. Yeah, um, absolutely. Not something you see every day. Um, but yeah, I, I, I enjoyed uh, that snapshot of Eric's, Eric's tenure at Gettysburg. That was, and not, yeah, like you said, Eric, I think played a pivotal role in, you know, what uh, the office was, was able to do in the years, years after um, he, he left and uh, certainly getting us on, uh, getting Gettysburg on sidearm was a, a, a key, a key moment. So you know, props yeah. to Eric. And of course, Eric's been the director of development at his high school alma mater, DeLone Catholic, which is not all that far away too. So seen Eric a couple times through the years. So again, thank you to Eric Lawrence. Now for the bread and butter. Obviously, Braden, we want to talk about your selections and some of your favorite moments. We've got a couple we're going to hold off because we have a special guest that's going to tune in here in a little bit. So we want to just want to start things off with the men's lacrosse game against Ursinus. That 2015 championship, that 2015 team was just unbelievable. It's so fun to watch out there. Why was that one of your favorite memories? Uh, you know, I think every, I mean, first of all, I'll, I'll say this, um, and thanks again for allowing me to weigh in and share some of my memories, but I, it was, was not easy selecting just a couple of events, you know, and he, in 11 years, man, it, I think, like I said earlier, I think we could have picked one from just about every team when I was there. It was, it was, there were so many great games and so many teams that had such a high level of success. Uh, it was a really, really a lot of fun made, made, made the job so much so enjoyable um and the, but with the men's lacrosse game in particular that season there was something about the games that I chose something stood out about those games there were, we, there were lots of great games there were lots of close games um but this one I think it was such a dramatic turnaround that year you know the team hadn't been in the conference championship in a couple of years um and uh but 2015 it just all clicked I think it was what was it 16 straight wins to start the season going into that game um you know uh we got some just, highlights here too for you yeah you know and uh and it was it was such a great game you know that they had gotten out to a big lead I believe and then were able to hold off a late uh a late rally by her sinus um you know and coach Jancic shared I think he shared uh, even before the season, this, the senior class had spoken before the, I think during the fall and uh, had talked about this vision that they had of, of winning the, the Centennial Conference title uh, in, in Musselman Stadium on a sunny day, um, which would have required them most likely going undefeated in conference play to get there, which they did. Um, and so their, their vision came Team true. That's name in the biz, Bijan Fierzan. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Bijan and Matt, Maddox were just such a great duo. Uh, Tim Brady, of course, was the goalie uh, as a freshman, came on and made such a huge difference uh, in what that team was able to accomplish. So, um, but yeah, it was, again, to go from, I think they had been nine and seven back to back years to um, eventually going 20 and one and coming ever so close to getting to the national championship game. It was just, uh, I mean, there were so many games, even just that year that you could have looked at. The next week they played their science again uh, in the NCAA tournament. And it was another great game. Actually went into, I think, two overtimes. Um, 
but yeah, it was it was definitely a, a memorable moment, and um, you know, just uh, you know, one of many great great games, um, uh, men's lacrosse games I was able to witness in Kingsburg. Yeah, of course, there were great games against Salisbury too. There's been some barn burners uh, the last two springs against WNL, so. Always fun to go out there and watch the men's across team. Great alumni base, too. I mean, they come back, and they're always so easy to talk to. And, um, you know, they could pop up in the press box and say hi, too. So moving on, obviously, you've got two games from men's basketball. And I actually have the one game from the 2008 national tournament, that second round game. You know, I remember that first game, Powers, Andrew Powers, and then Dan Katkin combined for 62 points. And we beat St. Louis State in a really high-scoring game. And then that second game was just insane. Like, it was crazy what was going on in that game. Why was that one of your top top picks? Well, I think that one was, uh, was more just sheer drama. I mean, how often do you see, you know, somebody single-handedly take over a game in the last 30 seconds like uh, Corey Dorsey did? Yeah, it was, you know – it was pretty epic um, and just something you don't forget, you know, um, yeah, and doing it at such a crucial moment, you know, with the uh, birth in the sweet 16 hanging in the balance and doing it in front of a spirited crowd, you know, that game was played during spring break, but yet there were, you know, a decent number of, of fans managed to come out and, um, uh, and then to have to hit a, you know, for him to hit three, three pointers and 30 seconds and then, uh, have Elms hit a half court buzzer beater, um, which momentarily seemed to to you know squash um, the, quiet the crowd. But um, of course, it was waved off because it came after the buzzer. But uh, yeah, it was it was really uh, just something you don't see very often, um, for sure. And it was definitely an exciting moment. It was a tough game, like you said, coming off uh, that up tempo win over. Salem State the night before I think they scored 94 points and then have to have to come back you know on such short rest after such a uh, a draining game probably coming off an emotional high as well of winning their first NCAA playoff game but but uh, yeah, Corey but Dorsey <laughs> came out Sorry. what's that go ahead yeah no it, it was uh Corey Dorsey did the rescue and um but you know again so many men's basketball games that I can remember when I was there that would have been worth mentioning, you know, their conference championship the next season at F and M was, was really a great game with, um, you know, where Dan Capkin kind of went off and hit, I think it was six, three pointers and um, really kind of um, capped off a late season turnaround. They had been, had dropped, I think to third or fourth in the conference, um, but beat the top two teams in the la their last two regular season games to, uh, uh, finish, I believe, third and get out of the play-in game, and then um, to go down again into to go into the Mazer Center um, and uh, beat the Diplomats on their home floor for the conference title was certainly never any never a small task, but they were able to do it. Yeah, it was a great team. Uh, there was an alumni chat the other day that I was a part of, and Chris Navolo was on there, so we were reminiscing about that as well as your number one moment. Now, unfortunately, we tried to get our guy Corey Weissman to join us today for a chat he's working though so glad he's still staying busy glad he's still able to to get out there he's a physical therapist in Jersey so hopefully we can do a thousand to one reunion at some point this summer working out the details on that with Corey but in his stead we'll try to break down that that moment from our perspective um, I was actually on paternity leave so I literally was the only person that wasn't in that gym but you were there, it was senior day. Just describe that moment. For those that don't know, Corey Weissman, freshman, suffered a stroke, hadn't been able to play basketball at all. I mean, he was partially paralyzed for a long time and he worked his way back. And then that moment hit and it all kind of was just a flurry of action there at the end. So talk about that and why that's your favorite moment. Well, I think that game and, and the things that transpired <clears throat> that day were just so different than anything any of us who were there or have heard about this have ever witnessed. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was just, it was a moment that just transcended sports. You know, it was knowing what Corey had been through um, for the previous three years, 
um, you know, getting to know him a little bit through um, some of the some of the media requests that he had gotten kind of sporadically through those first three years, you know, some, some of the media had heard that he had, what he had been through and he had, he opened up and, and talked about it, but it was, uh, it was evident early on what kind of person, kind of person Corey was when you would see him just, you know, in the, in the athletic training room, um, just such a hard worker and all, of, all the work and all the things that he had been through, um, is just it, it was amazing that uh, he was able to to do what he did and and to, and to keep after it and um, it was such an amazing moment um, even just prior to or before the end of the game um, just for Corey to come out um, during senior day um, and um, be recognized for all that he had done um, along with the two other seniors Tim Lang and Brendan Trelise was was an amazing, amazing moment in of itself that uh, you know, brought the crowd to its feet, and um, and then to get into the starting lineup, um, which is and brings you know kind of brings you to another angle, which is uh, the sportsmanship angle, which was was amazing that you had a, a coach and a team that were uh, played such an active role in everything that happened that day. You know, Rob Nugent um, you know, actively worked with uh, Coach Petrie to work out a way to get Corey into the starting lineup. And then at the end of the game, when he got into the game uh, to make sure, to call a timeout, make sure his team knew what to do, foul Corey, let him, let him get, you know, give him his chance at the foul line. Um, uh, just an incredible display of sportsmanship, you know, by, by Washington College. And they were, they were, were honored later with an award, a sportsmanship award, um, and rightly so. But then, you know, what happened at the end of the game, it was just, I mean, you couldn't have scripted it any better. Um, uh, you know, maybe they should make a movie out of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Obviously, this is 2011, 12, 2012. So the video footage is not the best. We hadn't moved into the HD realm quite yet. But you can see Corey at the line there. I don't know who was more. I, I bet if you ask Corey, he would say he wasn't nervous at all. <laughs> yeah, I think he Russell. said that. I think he said he was. After he missed the first, I believe he, he said that. Yeah. I never was never so confident taking another free throw because um, he would often he would always make the second and uh, yeah it was swish just a great, yeah just a great moment his first and only college point um, after being a thousand point scorer in high school and thus the title of the movie one thousand to one um, but you know and then everything that happened after that, you know, the word got out quickly. Um, D3hoops.com helped us. Pat Coleman, I believe, retweeted the, the story, the game story. And I, I, I'm positive that that helped um, get the word out to some of the national media, because that Monday we were getting calls from Yahoo Sports was one of the first to call, maybe the Baltimore Sun. Uh, and then Joe Lynch pitched in and uh, contacted uh, his former friend uh, who was working at ESPN, Greg Garber, who he knew from his Joe knew from his tennis days and Greg was able to work out uh, with ESPN a story. They were going to do a story on uh, college game day about Corey and his moment there on senior day and everything that he went through. And it was just amazing. Uh, and the way Corey held up through it all was, was amazing. Um, I never, <laughs> never once turned down an interview request, um, you know, and had to, you know, go back and, and relive some, some dark moments in his life, you know, many times, but um, you know, I think he, he impacted so many people that day and, and in the subsequent interviews and, um, and then of course later his movie, um, you know, I think he, I think Corey still in, is impacting people to this day. I know he's, he's been big on the public speaking um, circuit. So I uh, can't say enough about Corey Weissman and um, the kind of person he, he is and um, just the unbelievable game unbelievable day that was so much was going on that day in dream gym uh you know it was senior day for both basketball teams um there was a and possibly ask carol later on uh there was a ring ceremony between games the women's lacrosse team received its national championship rings uh in the gym between games uh uh there was um we talked about the 2001 2002 men's basketball teams they were back 
um, at halftime of the men's game to be recognized for it was their 10 year reunion of winning those two back to back conference titles. But yeah, Corey, you know, Corey stole the show. And oh, Coach Petrie became the all time winning <laughs> coach with that win. Yeah. <laughs> then handed the game ball over to Corey afterwards. It was, but you know what? I don't, I don't think anyone could, could imagine that day being any different. Um, it was, it just seemed like everything just, just fell in, into place. Um, all, the, all the little things behind the scenes, too. It was, it was really amazing. But yeah. Yeah, you mentioned just, Carol. She's actually in the waiting room right now. So I think it's time we admit her. And get her take on that day, too, since she was such an integral part of that. So joining us now is the head women's lacrosse coach, Carol Cantelli, the class of 1983 at Gettysburg. How are you doing, Carol? I am great, especially having the opportunity to sit among the best in the biz. Great to see you, Braden. Corey, you know, good to see you, I guess. I'll take I it. You, Corey. I miss you. Retelling that um, story of the infamous shot, I, I was getting chills listening to it. Uh, what an amazing day that was and couldn't have happened to a greater group of guys and um, just a beautiful heartwarming story. Um, so great to see how well Corey is doing as well. So that was a fun memory. Thanks for sharing that one. The best part of the picture. So Tommy Riggs, Janet Riggs, Janet and Ed's son, uh, our former president, she, he was interning for us, and he was sitting in the end bleachers and took that famous photo of Corey that's been plastered everywhere. If you look in the top left corner, there, there's you and all the women's across players waiting for like your rings and everything. So yeah, it's that's just right. funny to look at the different elements of that picture. You got Connor Poston like tensing up as if he was shooting the free throw and it's yeah it was just a great moment like everything just came together so so well um then and then later too with for the movie and everything too because they took over campus for like a month and mm -hmm. we all got to experience that carol when was the last time you got a paycheck for your speaking parts in the movie it's been a while but um you know <laughs> they're they're sustaining us these days you know that dollar 86 i get every now and again for um <laughs> having an appearance in the netflix uh movie mm -hmm. funny <laughs> yeah of course several staff members were in the movie uh we mentioned joe lynch earlier he was in it Jana riggs was in it cindy wright was in it you were in it i got chris novolo and i got to sit beside bo bridges bo bridges was the head coach george petrie through the movie so yeah it was quite the experience one of my memorable moments as well but for the sake of this i let Braden have that have all the thunder there <laughs> oh, there's, so carol i wanted to I wanted to bring you in now, obviously, to talk about the Corey Weissman thing, because you were such, you were involved there, you were there, you were in the movie. And then also, Braden had two game, two games on his list. We just finished up with some of the other ones, but Braden had the 2011 National Championship and the 2017 National Championship. And I was going to turn it to Braden to see why he put those particular games on his list, too. So, Brayden, you're, you're back on, and then we'll hear from Carol what she thinks of your memories of those games. Well, I mean, you never forget a, a national championship game. Uh, you know, uh, I consider myself lucky that I was able to witness three of them when I was, when I was at Gettysburg. Um, these two games, of course, and uh, the men's lacrosse team played uh, in the national championship game in 2009. Um, in Foxborough. Uh, in Foxborough, yeah, it was an outstanding uh, memory of going up there with the team for a, a week or so and gave Cortland a, a great game. But, um, but yeah, you know, to witness, uh, you know, the first national team national NCAA national championship, I should say. Of course, Daryl was on that field <laughs> hockey team that won the first national title of any kind back in 1980. But the first NCAA team title um, was – and you always remember the first time, you know, the uh, first conference title, first national title stand out so well, but it was just such a, uh, it was so surprising, I think, to see um, the team put on such a clinic that day. Maybe not to you, Carol, you drew up a great <laughs> game plan, but, uh, you know, you don't often see a team, uh, uh, you know, initiate the, the mercy role and, you know, <laughs> the first half of a national championship game. Uh, it was just a flurry of you know, Hannah Church, Kelsey Markowitz goals, and uh, it was it was a 
really fun to watch. And, um, you know, obviously it was a great moment for Gettysburg College and Gettysburg Athletics and uh, everything that the, the women's lacrosse team had been accomplishing, kind of just coming to a, you know, coming to a head that day. Of course, I'll have a little more to say on that game, too, for personal <laughs> reasons, but I'll save that. <laughs> so, Brayden, you, you also had the 2017 National Championship game on there as well, a 6-5 to five victory over TCNJ at Roanoke College. Um, what stood out to you about that game? Well, that one was, I think, stood out for maybe the opposite reason. It was, uh, it was a great barn burner down to the wire. Literally, was not, uh, <laughs> game was not decided until, you know, the final whistle is there was that scramble in front of our goal. Um, but uh, yeah, the thing I had mentioned in the story, just that, that image forever up that I'll remember is Steph Coulson taking the ball and just going end to end and uh, burying that, that big, big time game winning shot in the national championship game. It was, and you know, obviously TCNJ, you know, has a tremendous women's lacrosse, um, you know, uh, legacy there. And, uh, um, to, to go and beat them in a, in a national championship game was an amazing, amazing, amazing accomplishment. And, uh, um, you know, remember the, the, the team went up early at halftime, the, what, four to one, I think at halftime. And you kind of knew, or maybe you kind of felt there's probably a, a, run, a run coming here from TCNJ. And of course they did uh, rally. Um, but uh, that was a great team, you know, to, to hold TCNJ to, uh, you know, kind of stymie them defensively was was uh, just a testament to the defense of that team. You know, Shannon Keeler and, and the rest of the defense uh, was just such a pleasure to watch uh, down the stretch that year. And um, I, I was lucky enough to be able to do some commentary um, for some of the, the preceding games and, and the win over Salisbury to get to the Final Four, uh, where I think Salisbury was held to two goals. Um, it was just a tremendous uh, – just a tremendous team um, to watch that season and to, to uh, see it end in the national title is, again, something you, you don't forget. Yeah, definitely. I hope, hope you saw the uh, footage there with sharing with everyone's screens. It was a nice little video we did after the season, too. So a lot of great moments from that. So, Carol, how do those how do those memories? We can talk about the 2017 game for now because I've got some things to say about the 2011 game. But how does that 2017 memory from Braden stack up for you? Ah, uh, you know, uh, it it was a dream come true for those girls, and um, it was an incredible contest. Um, and you know, as a coach, you you really don't look back at the whole game you look at the moments that lead to that last game and so it was just a season's worth of uh fantastic accomplishments for individuals um great winning moment games uh the game leading up to getting us into the final four with salisbury was one that was just like you know this team's pretty good i i think that that game cemented the like we belong where we are going to be going. So it, it was just um, one of those years uh, where everything seemed to align just right, but the effort by the individuals was just outstanding. Um, I think what I remember most from that game, however, though, is it was a very clean game. They're, they're, both teams went 100% in their transition game. Um, the back and forth nature of the game was just outstanding and the defensive play by that group was like none I've ever seen. I mean, uh, ironically, I was working through some of my flop, uh, my um, hard drives and I needed to use a hard drive and I came upon um, one, one of the hard drives that had the game on it. And you know, we've got a little bit of time here these days. So I actually recently watched, before you guys were even doing this, I watched that game. And I got to tell you, it, it brought me to tears. Um, not because we won, but to watch the chemistry of the team and the dynamics of the team. Oh, and, you know, like Shannon Keeler had a great day in the cage, but she'll be the first to tell you it was the 
concert that the defensive unit of Mikes and Smith and Wagner and Colson and Holacek, um, uh, you know, all put together. Um, that was just really Neelan's, um, Ali Gorab, it, it, they were incredible. So that's, that's one of my memories of that game, just the way the defense and props to, to Barb and Kate, um, cause they oversaw that unit. Yeah, my memory of the 2017 National Championship game, because I was on the sideline doing some filming and stuff, is Kayla Nealon's getting bumped out of yeah. out of bounds near me, like within five feet of me, jumping up, fixing her goggles, and then just darting after this girl on the clear transition and catching up with her. Um, she right. had a little help defensively. Someone pulled off and forced the, the attacker back a little bit. But, I mean, just that grit and determination out of that 2017 and that's a good transition for me because I have – obviously, I have some lacrosse on mine because I've been there for all three national titles. So that 2017 team, I had a hard time separating that from 2018 because with a lot of the same cast of characters, of course, the previous season, you know, you have Neelins and um, Caroline Jager and some others there too. Yeah, but the 2018 each. team is like – yeah, Cassie. The 2018 team too is just kind of fit that same mold. But the thing that stood out about 2018 is the fact that it was postponed. Mm -hmm. We had crazy storms coming through the valley that forced a postponement of the national title game. We had to move it from Sunday to Monday. And it was everybody just kind of stuck with it and powered through. Um, and we, we pulled it out. I mean, we, we got ahead of Middlebury there at the end of the first half, put in some goals, some, some girl named Liza Barr threw in a couple goals. And, you know, we, we pulled it off Courtney Patterson. I mean, they were all right there. And it was just another great win to be a part of another great national championship in 2018. Absolutely. Yeah, those are, and, you know, we, we came to, I think another reason why it's difficult and they kind of piece together is they were both in the same venue. And uh, when people, people ask our team, or certainly when people have asked me, what's your favorite place? I'm like, oh, Roanoke, Virginia, it must, must visit. <laughs> um, it, and it's just both, both of those memories were by far some of the most favorite that uh, we've had. And um, it, it's a special, special place to the women's lacrosse program, um, as is the Delphi University. Yeah, I remember the lacrosse, both Middlebury and Gettysburg having like a little cheering, singing contest in the stairwell of the Kreger Center leading down to the field before one of the last times we went out to the field on the day it was postponed. Oh, it was right, a little behind the scenes, you know, uh, on that note, um, both the Middlebury coach and I are, are very good friends. And, um, you know, we, we had a lot of little powwows over the course of the lengthy delay um, on that Sunday. And while we were feeling bad to all the people that work the event and to all the families that traveled far, um, we were concerned about the well-being of the players um, having to have that mental fatigue that resulted in physical fatigue over the course of that long, long day. Um, because we, we had to go in and out of the locker room. And, you know, like any team, the pregame to get ready to go out, into the, uh, out from the locker room involves a lot of dance parties and um, energy. And then you go out there and um, you're – you're asked to return back. So, you know, we were mentally fatigued. I remember talking to, to Kate from Middlebury and saying, like, I don't think I'm going to be very efficient out there if we get out there. Um, I'm fatigued. And I can only imagine the kids. And she felt the same way. So we were very grateful that the NCAA committee decided to postpone for the following day so that we could put on the best pro – we could put out the best product um, and it was a great decision, and everyone was much um, more well rested for that day. Yeah, it worked out really well. Worked out really well in our favor. Um, we won the game 11 to 9. So I'm going to swing to what was my top moment, and the reason why I invited you here was the 2011 national championship game. Like Braden was saying, you always kind of remember your first conference title, your first national championship, and this was my experience, first experience with that. Now, Brayden talked about the on-field domination of the team with, you know, Becky Lutz and Maddie Coleman, uh, Lexi Kelly, Laura McIntyre. I mean, I could name almost everybody on that team from the senior to the freshman. But for me, it was everything that happened away from the field. Um, the game was awesome. We dominated the game. 
the NCAA officials, the commentators were blown away. They had no idea what was going on. Um, props to Bowden. I mean, they knocked off a extremely talented TC and J team, but our girls were just ready to go on that game. But it was really interesting to lead up to that. And for me, that's what it all was just through the whole season because, you know, in typical fashion preseason, you say that we're not going to be a contender, which actually I may have agreed with you that year coming off some spectacular seasons and losing some spectacular players like Hollis Stahl, uh, Just Crane, um, you know, Nicole Dottillo and others from the, pre the previous year. Yeah, we you lost know, 10 we starters. Ten. Yeah, 10, 10 yeah. starters and four yeah. All-Americans from that team, like 500 point scores as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I had a conversation with you and it was like, okay, what are we going to do this year? And then we had some close gritty losses, Hamilton, TC and J, F and M twice, unfortunately, but then nationals rolled around and something just clicked. And, you know, we mowed through Adrian Claremont mud scripts was a little closer than I thought it'd be, but we still got by then. And then it was Salisbury who had played one of the best games I've ever seen them play the previous semifinals to beat us on their way to a national title. And we, I vividly remember Kelly Speaker bouncing a ball past their goalie and the SIDs wondering what goal number of the season that was and me saying it was three because she literally bounced three balls in the goal in the entire year. So we won that um, at Salisbury and then we went to Adelphi. And that was my first experience with New York City, um, Long Island, national, you know, the, the national championship game, playing in the national championship game because we had hosted the prior year. And just the experience and talking to the young women on the bus, they were asking about my proposal to my wife. Um, my wife was pregnant at the time, so we were talking about that. I remember talking to Katie Blumenthal and Kendall Akey and Kelsey Markowitz in the front of the bus about it all and going through that whole situation. And then, you know, you had the, the um, community service at the elementary school, which was fantastic mm -hmm. to see the interactions there. We had the picnic at the beach where the bus almost hit a bridge that was too low for the bus. Uh, right. We sneaked by there, thank God. And then just the, the climax of the entire weekend was getting a text from Kelsey Markowitz saying that the bus had left me when I was writing the story and that you guys were coming back to get me. So like that was, that's the reason why this particular story, this particular game stands out to me was for that moment and I'm never going to let you live that down. No, I knew I knew you would bring that up. We thought you were on the bus, Corey. It was it was like 6 hours after the game. Where were you? <laughs> you know, I'd interviewed all of your star players and <laughs> was texting back back and forth with Braden and Paul Redford and Joe Lynch to set everything up for the post arrival at the Jager Center and everything there. But at least I made it back, and then I got to see the police escort into town and the whole celebration there that followed, too. So that's why that game sticks out to me, not even because of the domination on the field, but everything that followed along with it. All those small particles of time that all built upon each other to create this huge, magical moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I would agree. I think um, it is the buildup of even years prior uh, you know, that 2011 team, while we all maybe thought that they were a young group, they had incredible mentors and the program was really getting um, some, already had had some established, some really deep roots. And so the tradition was established from, you know, it's way back from the 2000 team and the two. 2006 team that made it to the final four. Uh, so the players were just trying to um, rise to the standards that had been previously set by some incredible programs um, prior to that. Um, I also think there's um, two kind of interesting stories uh, as a result of um, that final game. Um, one is I believe our team's success was cemented at Washington College, um, where we have a tradition of a player taking turns reading a pregame game day story. And um, on that day of playing Washington College, which was in early April, mid-April, Becky Lutz had the game day story. And she shared a story about her, what her father used to say to her. And he'd always say, um, do you have the C? 
And, you know, she never really quite understood what he meant. What is a C? And so she talked about that in the game day story. And she talked about it for her being courage and confidence. And so she empowered our team before the Washington College game about showing up with courage, showing up with confidence. And that became kind of like, do you have the C today? Do you have the C today? When we went on to win that game 20 to four, the largest gap we've had with Washington College and who at the time was 10 and four. Um, and we, we kept referring to that so much so that leading up to going to the final four, we made t-shirts where on the back, we had a bright orange C on the back and nothing else. And only our team knew because we encouraged the team to say, what's your C? It could be something different for you. For Becky, it was courage and confidence. Well, wouldn't you know it, our first team were playing in the final four, the semi game, which truly to me was the game of game, was Cortland. So we come out with these shirts and Cortland thinks we're talking about them on the back of their shirts. Um, and that kind of was like a little advantage we didn't even realize. Um, leading up to the Cortland game, and if you remember, those games were very late in the day because Division II was also at the same site. So they played their first two games. Our game was followed by the Bowdoin TC and J game, who, if you were going to gamble that day, you were putting all your money on TC and J to win. So we're able to watch the game being played out. Um, the coach, the kids are in the locker room. The coaches are out in the hallway watching it live stream. And we're all like, oh my God, Bowdoin is giving us the greatest gift known to man because TC and J was our nemesis. And we, you know, you don't want to play him if you don't have to. So we realized that TC and J is going down and it was a battle. So we walk into the locker room and I say, Whoever wins this 8 o'clock game, this game started at 8 o'clock, whoever wins this game is going to be the national champion on uh, Sunday. So let's go. And we had a heck of a battle. We, um, they, went out, they went on a three-goal run. Then we went on a five-goal run. And then the rest of the game, everyone settled in because I think all of us knew, like, whoever's winning this game has a pretty good shot. Um, and we, you know, we're nervous, of course, and then we settled in and it was a back and forth game the rest of the night. Um, and I think the C rattled Cortland, but the C motivated Gettysburg. Um, and we, we ended up winning that game. Um, and the, the other second crazy story that takes us into the, um, Sunday game is, I don't know if you remember this, Corey, but we had no hotel. Oh. Um, the NCAA did that weekend was they only reserved the um, hotel for the advancing team. And so everyone had to leave the hotel. Well, we were going to spend the night regardless. So I gave up the, um, the gamble of whether we were going to stay that night or have to drive home to Gettysburg. If we didn't win, we wanted to spend the night and have the whole experience. Well, wouldn't you know it, in um, Garden City area, there was graduations. The men were hosting um, a semi-game in, in men's lacrosse in Division I. Um, we were in the same ho uh, hotel with uh, the Virginia men's team. So we were laughing about the orange and blue with the Virginia guys. So we ended up um, deciding to, like, gamble and try to find a hotel. Thanks to the great work of Susan Fumigali um, as our assistant athletic director, she found us this awesome hotel, but it was in Long Island traffic. It ended up being an hour away. So if you recall, that game started at eight. We didn't get out of Adelphi until close to 11. We didn't get to that hotel until like 1230, and it was rocking. There was all kinds of um, events going on. Um, and the coaches didn't really do much of a scout report for Bowden because we were confident that TC and J was going to win, which was a bad move on our part. But I have to say, we stayed in the most swankiest hotel. It was awesome. All the kids had their own robes. We had this brunch the next morning that was like 
all unbelievable. I mean, it was a really high end hotel. Um, and we woke up with the C. We woke up saying, we're winning this game. So uh, honestly, the day was fantastic the next day because every one of us just were like, hey, we've already won it in our minds because we were uh, together and we just got to, um, you know, it was great that we had such a goal differential because we could really have fun while we were playing and, and kind of really let our hair down a little bit. So long story, but a, a good one. And I agree, there was all those things that went on behind the scenes that made the, the weekend so spectacular. Yeah, I agree. Uh, my, my recollections, my favorite moments story is coming up in a couple minutes. And I actually referenced that hotel switch. And I remember we all joked that the Kardashians were having a party on the roof. And I don't know about you guys, I didn't sleep at all. I don't know how the players or the coaching staff could have slept either, just yeah. from nervous anticipation of the game, let alone the noise and everything. But hey, everything, everything worked out. We all made it back to Gettysburg and then slept two or three days after that. <laughs> well, and I'll, um, I'll never forget, for some reason, like, you know how the hotel has a little, like, um, cons not food area, late night, get a soda, get a drink or something. So she was the one that was serving as both like um, letting us in and then selling water because we kind of ran out of a lot of supplies. Um, she was, her son was a baseball player at Gettysburg at that time. So I'm like, oh, this is fate. I always look for signs and I'm like, okay, we got a fan in this hotel and a kid that's an athlete, we're winning this thing. <laughs> It's such a small world. Yeah. Well, we've 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 talked we've talked a lot about uh, lacrosse, Carol. I don't know if you have anything else you want to say. I got a couple more of games on my list. I was just gonna reveal for the grand reveal here that aren't lacrosse related. So, did you have anything else that you wanted to talk about? No, but I I just think it's so hard to do um, what you guys were were charged to do because. Uh, there's just so many incredible games that have happened at Gettysburg College. And um, it's, it's not even about the games. It's about the people in those games, right? And we've been so blessed, haven't we, to have so many outstanding athletes and um, coaches and memories that we made. And I will tell you, you guys are, are the best in the business. I sincerely mean that. And, you know, I think you, you're, you're valuable more than you know, because right now across the world, all these former athletes are getting together and having Zoom chats, and their stories are probably so fabricated at this point, and yet you guys separate uh, the fact from the fiction. So I appreciate all the work that you guys do, and um, I hope you're both staying safe and healthy and enjoying your times with your families. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining us, Carol. We, we definitely appreciate it. I just have a, a couple more games. Carol, you're welcome to, to stay on, but I know you got a busy recruiting schedule and everything too. Zoom chats all afternoon with prospective players as well as former players and current players too. So um, you're welcome to, to duck out now if you want. I will. Thank you. Take care, you guys. Take care, Carol. Bye. Bye. Carol. So, Braden, I'm not going to let you go quite yet because one of these memories, two of these memories I actually share with you. So, um, one of the memories I have is a first football trip to Johns Hopkins University. I remember us piling in the car. I believe it was a Gettysburg car. And going down there, it was my first trip to Baltimore, my first trip to Hopkins, my first night college football game because my previous institutions didn't have lights on their fields. And it was such a great experience. A, we met uh, Ernie LaRosa and Joe Geis, uh, Joe Olson Geis. Um, who was great. I mean, they're great colleagues to this day at Johns Hopkins. They run the athletic communications team down there. The two of my favorite people in our profession. And I'm sure you would agree to that as, as well, as well as Jill's husband, Scott, the splendid Spartan. We'll give him a <laughs> shout out. Too. And then the game itself. I mean, that season was really good because you had Tom Sturgis, you had Matt Flynn on the offense. Um, so many different parts to it. I was going through the, the old box score the other day. We dominated defensively, Harold Barton, Josh Gerald, were just machines defensively. The offensive line dominated. James Russell anchoring on that left side, Lou Mistrini, and they just put it together. I remember vividly, Sturgis always did what Sturgis does, rushing for 125, 150 yards. I remember Flynn breaking out for that 50-yard dash to the end zone along the right side, I think, and just scoring that touchdown. 
and it was the first time we beat Hopkins in 13 years. Uh, I don't know when the first time it first went at Homewood in years two. And then, you know, Hopkins the year after, that's when they started their domination of the Centennial Conference too. So that game just from a personal standpoint kind of stood out, stood out for me. I don't know if you remember that game at all or not. Yeah, I remember that game. It was – it's interesting you mentioned it first night football game you had seen. It might have been the same for me. I, Lebanon Valley never – that was my first year at Gettysburg as well as yours. And Lebanon Valley didn't have lights, and I don't think any of their opponents did. Um, so there was that – certainly that aspect of it, but yeah, that, that game was, uh, I think certainly, um, you know, a great example of what, uh, that some of those offenses could do led by Matt Flynn and, and Tom Sturgis and, and many others. Uh, you know, I think, I believe they, there were two 100 yard rushers that game, right? Was it Sturgis and Matt both rushed for 100 yards? Yeah, uh, they both did. That's why it stands out to me as well. Quarterback, yeah. What Matt could do as a quarterback, throwing the ball in, running it, was was outstanding. And um, I, I don't like when you approached me about uh, about you know participating in this. Um, you know, I I thought back. Uh, I almost kind of included a football game. You know, there was the comeback against Susquehanna. Oh. Where, uh, they yeah. were down. Was it fifty to twenty eight late in the third quarter? It ended up winning sixty one to fifty. And I was just there was that that offense was just incredible. That was um, actually a Kyle Whitmore led team, but certainly that game that game stands out, you know. And um, it was it was just a a real pleasure to be able to cover what uh, what the football team was able to do. Um, yeah, know, under for that sure. spread wing offense. Yeah. And football only having ten games a year, they have a little bit of an advantage in a situation like this because we haven't seen as many games as say a basketball season that's twenty some games long. Uh, I know Ke Bob Kenworthy referenced some games from '85. He talked about the playoffs in '85 games against Lycoming and Salisbury, and then the ice ice rink against Ithaca. And then you know I also have the the hundredth game against F and M, which was awesome because we that was the first time we gave out the Lincoln Trophy and we won that game 28-14. And then I remember Jamel Matunga's 80-some yard touchdown run in a driving rain against FNM too. That just image is plastered in my head of him busting through the middle of that line because we couldn't see anything. And he goes off and runs that, runs that touchdown in, um, I believe it was 2008, so the year after this particular Hopkins game. So a lot of great moments on the football field for sure. A lot of great moments in women's basketball too uh, since we arrived – They've been to Nationals five times. Um, that Sweet 16 team holds a lot of great memories for me with Caitlin Moser and Allie Drexler, Courtney Fields, Mary Spicer. But then the 2013 team stood out to me because of the three games against Swarthmore. And I'm sure you remember this. Katie Lytle might be one of the most talented players in Centennial Conference history. Later served as an intern with the conference for a little while. And unfortunately, she ran into this Gettysburg team that just seemed destined for greatness. You had Caroline Murphy, Corey Youngins, Alyssa Eisler, Katie Early, Jess Porter, uh, Jenna Swope, Sam Pagel. Like, I can go on and on, obviously. It was a great team. They had two games against SWAT where they split. Each team won on the road by a point. And then in the championship game, we just managed to pull it out by two points. SWAT missed the potential game-tying shot and then a half-court shot. And then the crowd just remember, just just rushed the field. I remember uh, Jeff, the, the weasel, coming down to hug Coach K and Coach K getting his first Centennial Conference title um, ever in 2013. So that was a really great moment for me too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I remember the – unfortunately, I couldn't make it to the championship game that year, but uh, I remember the how much support uh, the men's basketball team provided with uh, – Alex Zern leading all the cheers from up in the student <laughs> section and really making it a, a great atmosphere. Um, I remember watching that game online because I couldn't, I couldn't make it in, but uh, uh, yeah, certainly uh, some, some great memories there with, with that team, what they were able to do and um, getting the women's team there first. That was legitimately the largest crowd student crowd that I've seen in that gym up until the, uh, the recent, Centennial Conference Championship games against Haverford the last couple of seasons has been pretty packed. But that 2013 crowd was amazing. I mean, it was like the Duke fans with their arms raised and every time a free throw would go down, they would just put their hands down. And yeah, props to the men's basketball players that year, particularly Alex, running up and down the uh, bleachers and getting everybody pumped up for it. 
So my final one comes from arguably our most successful conference sport, and that is swimming. Of course, when Mike Riley was head coach, we won 42 conference titles. We're up in that 50 range between the MAC and the Centennials. And this past year, uh, you missed out on this, but the women's team came back and won their conference title. So they hadn't won since 2013, uh, the Maggie Mulderig years. And it'd been a little while. Ursinus had dominated. And this year, the team really put it together. Kate Crilly, who, you know, you wrote about very often uh, for two years, won two conference titles in the 5100, hit eight uh, B cuts. Um, these freshmen were awesome. Alyssa Clancy, Hannah Wasson, Talia Moss was rookie of the meet. Kate was swimmer of the meet. Uh, some sophomores, Katie Cooper was awesome in the breaststroke, Megan Warner. So many great performances. We ended up winning 11 events. And I'm sure we, you got to go in the Wayback Machine to find a time we won 11 events at Centennial Conferences because it's such a talented pool of swimmers. Broke 11 school records. The 200 medley relay qualified for nationals, which unfortunately they weren't allowed to go participate. Um, but they were designated All-Americans thanks to the Coaches Association. So Kate Crilly ended her career as an All-American. And she was probably my favorite moment, just seeing her power her way to titles and two events where the most minimal, minimal mistake means you could finish last. So she powered her way to it. So I know you kind of missed out on that this year, but it was such a great moment. I know you saw your share of great moments in the pool as well. And you can't, you can't beat the crowd in the Bullets pool. Between no. the athletes and coaches, Mike Raleigh was awesome to work with. Greg is great to work with now, Greg Brown. And then the parents who are so appreciative of everything we do. I don't, I mean, I love the other parents that we work with, but the women, the swimming parents, you know, we're right there with them. They, they tap you on the shoulder, say great job. Um, shout out to Frankie Nieves in case he's watching. I mean, they're, they're just fantastic, the swimming parents. And I had such a good time the last two years working with them uh, directly since, since you left. But you worked with swimming, obviously, for your first 11 years, too. Yeah, yeah it, was, it, was, uh, it was a great experience uh, being able to work, um, work with and, and cover such a successful team. And like you said, just being in the presence of so many great people. It's, it's a little bit of a different atmosphere there in the bullets pull with where we, you know, you set up for your streaming video, you have parents all around and you can, it's a little easier to converse um, with them. But uh, yeah, it's certainly, there's certainly been <clears throat> just so many great, uh, great moments there with the swimming teams just in the last dozen years or so. And um, yeah, it's again, another, <laughs> another team that would have been great to, to, you know, for me anyway, to go in a little more into depth on some of the great, Moments. It's funny you posted the photo of me there with uh, talking to uh, Emily Yelmans, uh, who was on the women's swimming team, and that was I think that was from 2009 when they had just won on the last event uh, where the 400 freestyle relay had won the clinch. It came down to the last event and they won it, uh, which was a great a great moment in of itself. And but yeah, it was uh, yeah, it's just a, a great program, and certainly what Mike Raleigh did there was was tremendous. Um, coaching you know 30 35 years whatever you know it's just uh yeah and it's another one of those sports like men's across where you could go all day and pick stuff out you go matt libby in 2010 or 11 and then you hit the jason potter ashton lions mike Harmon years like how do you single out any one of those performances they're all so amazing and hopefully down the line we can give them all their due as well and, and having the and yeah absolutely and, and having that sort of facility was, is, you know, it's just such a, a great thing because I remember um, uh, the first year that uh, the Gettysburg hosted the Centennial Conference Championships and, the, and both teams swept, and I, I believe they swept the next year too, um, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to win a conference title in front of your home crowd. It's just, a, it's amazing. Um, and it's, a, it's such a bonus uh, to be able to have that sort of facility to, to um, you know, to be able to you know, host that kind of an event, and um, especially when you're, you know, you're able to to win the title. Um, so yeah, certainly. But you know, I'm sure this year was certainly, certainly an exciting meet, being the first one for the women's team in in quite a few years. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. 
So, Brayden, I know we ate up a lot of time today. Uh, it looks like we're almost around an hour of, of talk, and it doesn't really feel like that. But I just want to thank you for, for you know, working with me for 11 years and everything that you imparted to me, the knowledge and just being a good friend, good colleague. Thank you for contributing to this, too. I hope it was a fun trip down memory lane for you, as it was for Eric, Matt, and Bob as well. So I wish you, wish you the best, uh, you and, and Misty and Clay and Baby to be. Uh, what's the due date? Uh, she's likely going to be um, probably delivering mid-July or so, by the looks of it. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's an exciting time for us, and uh, uh, hard to believe. But uh, but thank thank you for those those kind words, and um, yeah, it was certainly it was certainly a fun time. I can't believe how fast it went, um, but it was it was you know great a great uh, experience uh, to be able to work in such a great athletic department with, with such great staff and being around um, so many great student athletes and, and, and certainly sharing the time with you. It was great. You know, you're a great coworker and uh, you know, you're doing a, an outstanding job with everything now putting on these, these zoom events and, uh, and uh, just all that you've been doing here in the last two years is you know, doing a tremendous job. And I enjoy occasionally taking a peek and, uh, seeing how things are going back at the battlefield. So um, anyway, uh, thanks, thanks for having me and, and letting me participate in this and go down back memory lane a little bit, but uh, um, stay safe. I hope, um, you know, the rest of this time of quarantine goes well. I hope you and the family are well and um, good luck uh, down the road. Thank you, Braden. And same to you. Give my regards to Misty and our Former colleagues, Daryl Keckler and Doug Sage, former assistant coaches, always good to, to bring up in, them up in conversation. Uh, we'll see if we can do this again sometime. It was fun. We'll see if we can break it down with some other teams too, try to get some other coaches on here to really break down and get to some of the uh, events that we saw that we weren't able to mention today too. So for Braden Snyder, for Carol Cantelli, I'm Corey Jewett signing off. Go Bullets. <laughs>